All right. Well, everyone, it is noon. And if you've come to these before, you know that I like to start right on time. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And today I have with me Jamie Estes, who is with Southern Teachers, and he is the Director of Searches. So I'm going to share my screen and just uh, provide a little bit of context for what we're going to talk about, and then we will get going. So Jamie, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Um, so today we're going to talk about leadership and personality traits. And on our blog, we have a guest post today from Lori Pelko, who was last week's webinar guest on leadership lessons learned. And next week's webinar is going to be focused on data. We're going to have a guest speaker here who is an upper school division head who did some thinking about how his school could use data differently in their DEIB work and how that could help them make progress. So just wanna remind everybody, independentcurriculum.org, if you haven't downloaded the principles for independent curriculum yet, we would love for you to do that. And finally, this is this week's Pulse. And I'm gonna drop a link to the Pulse in the chat. This week's question was, what leadership skill do you most want to develop? And this went out on yesterday, Tuesday, and we've got a good number of answers already. You're absolutely welcome to contribute. And here's what we've seen so far. People are interested in building their communication skills. They wanna be inspiring to those they work with. They want to help in collaborative decision-making, consensus building, and they wanna make decisions. They wanna be decisive. So, Jamie, I think this is a great segue into our conversation. Yeah, um, thanks. So uh, Sarah did share, share that with me before and asked me what, how it might relate to the idea behind the study and our use of personality research in general. But um, interestingly, several of those, um, communication, um, inspiration, um, you know, those, those pieces, talk about the leader's relationship to other people. And so that's the key piece for us when we talk about um, our version of personality uh, research is that we're not looking so much at the person's identity, what the person thinks of themselves, but um, understanding better how other people perceive this person. Um, you know, quick, Quick aside, I was listening to an interview yesterday or, or a book actually um, in the last couple of days and they talked about the concept of self-consciousness and what is self-consciousness? When are we self-conscious? We are not self-conscious when we're alone. We're self-conscious when other people are looking at us. So the whole idea of our sense of self is less really important to how we to perceive ourselves, but how are other people perceiving us? And the better we understand that, the more effective leaders or you know, colleagues we can be. Yeah. All right, so let's back up just a little bit, just in case people don't um, know who you are. I know I gave a really brief introduction, but could you just tell us a little bit about your role at Southern Teachers and how this, this research project got underway? Yeah, so... Um, uh, I've been with Southern Teachers for 14 years. Um, I started as an English teacher and was a division head at a school in Eastern North Carolina and fell into this work, which most people who do this work do. Um, fell into it mostly because I wanted to live in Charlottesville, which is where our office is. Um, and was doing several searches. And, and I think you know, it's an example of um, you know, getting into something, the personality data based on um, a failure. So um, a lot of times we work with candidates and, and they sort of think, well, you know, you don't know what we're going through. You don't know that, you know, you don't know what interviewing's like. Well, in fact, we're in our interview season. This is the season when schools are calling us and saying, hey, we're interviewing three firms. Um, convince us you're the one um, to, to help run our search. So, so I'm deeply in that process right now. And we did one. Um, and one of the questions that came up in the in that pitch meeting was, do you use personality assessment? And I said, no, we do not, but it's something that we've been thinking about. So we didn't get that search, but I went back and I called the person who asked the question and said, hey, I just wanted to you know, follow up with you. Do you, you know, tell me about your use of it? 
course, she was in corporate um, banking, I think. Um, and she said, Hogan Assessments is, is the one that you should go with. So I did a little bit of research um, and we started using Hogan um, in our practice. Um, and it is not an easy tool. It's not, it's not just a, you know, send it off and get a report and immediately know what to do with it. There's a lot of interpretation involved with it. So there was a lot of training and a lot of research. And one of the pieces of research that I came across was Whitkeeper, which is a, a search firm that mostly works in higher ed, had done a study comparing um, college presidents to corporate leaders in terms of personality. They'd, they'd had 100 college presidents take the Hogan, um, looked at the data, compared it. It was about a three or four page um, article. I thought it was really interesting and said, what a cool idea we could do with this with independent school heads. Um, for financial reasons, because Hogan's also very expensive, we just used one of the assessments. We got 247 heads to do it. And instead of writing a four-page article, which would have been super easy, we wrote nine four-page articles uh, <laughs> about each, about all kinds of stuff. And it's on our website, and I think Sarah will share that with, with you later. But that's kind of the story of Hogan about from why we started in the beginning, why we did the study, and we can talk more about how we use it if you're interested. Really, so it's good that you were a former English teacher when you had to, to write all of this. Foolish, it. foolish, you know. <laughs> Should have written a, a two-page thing and been done with it. But there was so much good data in there. Yeah. So, so what did you find out about heads of schools and personalities? Well, um, at the big macro level, so in eight, the Hogan Personality Index has seven scales. Um, and so the first thing we looked at is where are they similar to the sort of global norms and where are they different from the global norms? Um, and so they were pretty similar in a lot of them. The biggest one where they were an outlier. So 50th is the global norm per percentile um, average. Um, they, the heads that um, did it actually came out in the 65th percentile for interpersonal sensitivity. So interpersonal sensitivity is agreeableness, um, ability to get along with people, probably not surprising for school leaders in a social institution like a school that they would be good with people. And their second highest was ambition, so 60th percentile. So again, people who are good with people and who have ambition to lead um, tend to be move into leadership. Again, none of that's probably all that shocking, except when you then look at the corporate data. Um, in the corporate data, the highest scale by far is ambition, and the lowest scale by far is interpersonal sensitivity. So Hogan would say that two of the main drivers for people in general, ever since we've been social creatures, is to get along and to get ahead. And if you're a corporate leader, there's no conflict there. Getting ahead is more important than getting along. Um, if you're ever faced with a decision between preserving a relationship or moving the institution forward, you're you know, on average, that person's gonna move the institution forward. But for heads of school, very much in conflict. And I think that when we see heads really struggle or really feel pressure or um, something not work out, it's when they were forced, put in that position and didn't execute at maybe the level that the board wanted. And so one of the presentations that we created out of it was um, heads are from Venus, trustees are from Mars, and the whole thing was trying to get um, both sides to kind of see the perspectives that they bring to the table on, on how problems come up. Really interesting and a, a real divergence between those two, which, um, you know, one of the things that we hear folks say is well, school should be run like a business or this, that, and the other, and we always respond with no, you know, we, that's, we have a lot of business going on at school, but it's not the same. So it seems like that difference in mindset really is very apparent there. I wanna remind everybody, we've got time for questions for Jamie too. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A because we would love to answer those. Um, I also have a lot of questions. Um, so what surprised you? Did anything surprise you when you were doing this research? I think that one of the biggest surprises was around sociability. So sociability was the lowest score for heads of school. Sociability is 
it's probably the closest word we would normally use would be extroversion, but but it really comes around um, uh, that where the person gets energy. So uh, somebody high on sociability gets energy by being around people. Someone low on sociability has to expend energy to be around people and vice versa. Someone who's low on sociability gets energy by being alone. Someone who's high on sociability has to spend energy being alone. So it was very interesting to us that that was the lowest score um, because you would think again that sort of social institution, being around people would be important. But remember, they're really high on interpersonal sensitivity. So they actually are good at building relationships, but they are constantly needing to be around people. And so that sort of idea that the head is a lonely job. And this, you know, I know that not everybody, of course, on this call is heads, but that was our perspective in the, in the study. But that is a lonely job. Well, maybe, maybe the ability to be alone is one of the reasons, one of the key abilities for people who are successful as a head of school. And one of the reasons why we think that is we did demographic um, survey as well. So there were, we looked at male and female and age and age when they became a head and size of budget. And the bigger the budget of the school, the lower the sociability score. So the average sociability score for overall was 47. For heads of school with budgets over 20 million, it was a 40. Um, and again, you know, we don't know exactly why this might be, but just sort of thinking about it logically, the bigger the school, the smaller the head circle gets. Um, and so um, somebody who can really handle the loneliness of running a big school where you don't have a lot of meaningful relationships, you have a few key meaningful relationships, um, was kind of, we thought interesting. That is interesting. Um, so when you think about other academic leaders on campus and you think about what can they learn from this research? I think the most important thing of the study in general um, is that there is, not, there is not a personality that just, if you have this, you'll be an effective head of school. Um, that is not at all our approach with with personality research um, in general, or when we use it in our, um, you know, work with head searches, um, that in fact, what really separates effective people, no matter what, if they're head teacher, academic dean, dean of students, athletic director, is just having a really good sense of how other people see that person. Um, so the way that we kind of looked at this was, um, for each of the seven scales, we looked at a head who was really high on a scale or really low on a scale, and we interviewed that person. And we talked about, okay, you know, I can talk to you about this before, but, but um, really low interpersonal sensitivity. How could somebody, when the average is 65, how could somebody who's maybe in the 10th percentile for interpersonal sensitivity, how can that person be an effective head of school? We interviewed somebody that we knew or perceived to be an effective head of school and said, talk to us a little bit about this. And so those interviews I thought were really, really good, you know, to, to extend that example, you know, he talked a little bit about um, being at a big school. That was really important. He'd said, I don't think I could really be the head of a small school where I would be expected to know every, not only everybody's name, but their parents' name and their grandma's name, like that's not really who I am. And he said, every conversation I have at my school, because we are a big school, starts with, I know you're really busy, but, and he said, that to me is permission from that person to just cut to the chase, which is what I wanna do. Um, and I said, well, how do you, how do you create relationships if you're so low in a personal sensitivity? Because that's still a really important piece. And he said, I'm a good writer, I'm a good speaker. I can create relationships impersonally through that kind of communication and that's how it can be effective. So I think for everybody, it's just, it's not, okay, well, I'm, you know, uh, low ambition, can I be in a, can I, you know, achieve my goals? Absolutely, we had a great interview with that person um, who was a low ambition head. So I think it's, it's understanding um, more than anything. Um, yourself, how you come off to other people, that's important. Yeah, so 
Uh, we have a question posted here, which is, how does that sociability factor translate within business leaders? Was there a gap or a difference between school leaders and business leaders on their sociability? Um, that is a good question. I don't know that I know off the top of my head. So let me look real quick and see if I can pull that out. Um, I want to say that they were a little bit higher. Um, they were a little bit higher. Um, so which was a little bit higher? I'm sorry. U.S. executives' um, sociability was about around 60 and heads were 47. So pretty good difference there. Okay. Uh, interestingly, because I'm looking at the way Kiefer study for this information, university presidents um, were around 55, so a little bit higher than independent school heads. So that would be an interesting look, too, um, in terms of K-12 and, and higher ed. Yeah, for the most part, um, I'd say if you took an average of independent school heads and corporate leaders, you'd probably end up with university president numbers. That, that's kind of <laughs> where they came out. So they're somewhere in between. Interesting. And something I want to dive a little bit more into is this self-awareness. And you talk about self-concept and you mentioned that right as we were coming in too, that self-consciousness is that, um, that thing that we get where we think about ourselves when we're around other people. Mm -hmm. But then when you and I were talking before, you were talking about that gap between self-concept and reputation. Can you just illuminate that a little bit more and talk about it? Yeah, I was talking to somebody yesterday um, about um, a really, really high um, sociability head. And, and this was the story that he told. He said, I, I arrived at this party and I hadn't met this person. And somebody else said, hey, I'm gonna introduce you to this high sociability head. It didn't introduce her as high sociability head, but I'm gonna introduce the person that I happen to know as the high sociability head. And she said, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna walk up to that person and you're gonna to talk to yourself, talk about yourself for 45 seconds and she's gonna stop you. And then she's gonna talk about herself for 45 minutes. And he said, that is, exactly what happened <laughs> he walked up he talked to himself he talked about himself for 45 seconds and then she talked to her, her son about for 45 minutes i think the concept of that 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 high sociability person um realizing hey i'm coming off as dominant um in this conversation um if she's not aware of that then that's going to hurt her in her career um, potentially. So the self-awareness comes from, I know that I am really sociable and I can dominate rooms. And so I need to be very aware of that and make sure that I try to not be something I'm not, but to modulate that. Um, so when we talk about self-awareness, if we talk about identity, which is what people think of themselves and reputation, which is what other people think of them, what we would say is self-awareness is the, is the gap between the two. And you want that gap to be as short as it can possibly be. Great. And, um, and we've got another question, but before we get to that, what are strategies for shortening that gap that leaders can use? Well, part of it is using something like Hogan, um, and it's got to be, it's, not a Myers-Briggs or a DISC, which are um, ipsative. So um, when you take a Myers-Briggs, you are comparing yourself to yourself. Um, using a tool um, like Hogan or Ber Ber Berkman that's normative, where you get a number that com is compared to other people. But personality study is not the only way to get this. You know, you all have probably done 360 evaluations. That's another way. In fact, Hogan was created to be a proxy for a 360. Um, the way that they created Hogan was they said, um, they took 360 data on people, they gave them a personality assessment, and they said, okay, well, people who say they like roller coasters, other people tend to say this about them. So that's where Hogan comes from. But you can go straight to the source and, and do a 360. It's it's really about actually asking people in one way or another to say, how am I coming off? Checking in and saying, how, how is that going? And, and rehashing, okay, we just had that meeting. Um, going to someone you trust after that meeting and saying, hey, I was trying to be 
um, funny there, did it come off right? Or I was trying to really show that person that they need to change their behavior. Um, do you think it got through? Um, and because you're not gonna be able to tell that, we're, we're lousy at perceiving how we come off to other people, even though we think we're great at it. Yeah, we, that's a really good point. And then there are so many um, really well-documented research studies that other people's unconscious or conscious biases have an impact that is not necessarily within our control. And you know, those prejudices and beliefs can, can have a big impact. Did y'all take a look at any of that? Um, not per se, though, when we were looking at Hogan um, as a tool to use, we were looking for one that, um, you know, was validated for selection um, and had shown in various studies not to show bias. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, uh, any search process is fraught with when you reply, rely just on interviews is the bias of the interviewer. Um, Hogan is actually a completely objective tool. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't care anything about who you are. It just um, assesses, you answer these questions so other people tend to say this about you. Um, but in terms of um, you know, your own understanding of yourself, you might discover some of those biases in here. We tend to like people like us. So one of the questions we asked heads was, okay, um, you're really high prudence, which is sort of your conscientiousness scale. Do you tend to only surround yourself with other high conscientious people um, or do you try to mix that up? Because one of the things about the HPI is every scale, no matter where you are, is going to indicate strengths and weaknesses. So someone who's really high conscientious, conscientiousness is one of the scales that we say, it's the thing that gets you to leadership, but it may not help you stay there. You know, we tend to be promoted because we get things done and we're organized, but when we get into leadership, if we're still, you know, immersed in the details, then that could be a, that could be a problem for us. Um, so part of that by understanding your own bias is, okay, this is who I am. You know, am I making sure that I'm hiring people who are different than me? Right. So that's a great point. And I'm going to go to the next question, because I think this is a really interesting one. It stems from that. So earlier you were talking about being low ambition, not necessarily meaning that somebody couldn't be a good head of school. And I think this question is a good one because it asks, um, low ambition doesn't necessarily mean you don't want the job, right? So it's a personality trait, not a career choice. And mm -hmm. so can you maybe illuminate and explain that a little bit more? Yeah, ambition is actually um, sensitivity to reward. So um, for some people, you know, during, during COVID, some of us watched the Michael Jordan um, uh, documentary, that 10 part documentary. He's somebody that you would say is very high ambition because of his winning to him. He got a higher high from winning than maybe anybody ever. Um, and so when we talk about a high ambition, it's sensitive rewards. There are people who are out there um, who want to complete projects, who want to get promotions, who want to move forward, because not necessarily because they would think, well, I'm just better than everybody else. I mean, I don't think that's what the ambition is, is scaling. It's really, I, I get a lot of self um, uh, reward from, from achieving those things. So your high ambitious people may move into leadership because they're gonna put themselves into it. But the example of the low ambition leader um, was one of my favorite conversations because he said, you know, I was a, a, a young teacher and administrator at my school. My head came and said, I want you to succeed me as head of school. I think you have that potential, but I'm not gonna retire for 20 years. The high ambition person is like, well, forget it, I'm out of here because I don't wanna wait 20 years. Uh, he said, okay, 20 years works for me. Um, and he waited 20 years. Um, now, no guarantees that he would have become the head of school, but that really wasn't important to him. He said, every job I had as I moved up the organization chart, I loved. And I realized that when I got it, it was gonna be three years before I finally 
probably felt competent doing it. And so he was willing to take those steps because that's where he got, um, you know, that's where he got his uh, sort of self-concept and, and, and reward. That's great. So we got another question via the chat, and I think I know why this one came in um, this way just to me, but absolutely, y'all use the Q&A, but if you, if you want just me to see it, that's fine too. Um, but so this question has to do with being a senior academic leader at a school and your relationship with the head and how can how can senior academic leaders negotiate that in terms of what you mentioned earlier about heads having a little bit of a lonely circle, right? A small circle. And, and how do others in the school navigate that? Um, I'm not sure I know exactly. Um, I think that, um, well, it's sort of making me think uh, about phase two, and I don't know that this is exactly the direction that that, that question is leading. Um, but phase two of the study, which we're doing right now and still collecting data on, is the Hogan Development Survey. So if the HPI are day-to-day -day behaviors, the HDS is what are the behaviors that come out when we're not monitoring ourselves carefully, um, when we're a little less self-conscious than we should be, maybe, um, or when we feel some sort of loss of control, what do we do to try to get that control back? And this is particularly important, I think, as somebody who's reporting to a head, is understanding where those maybe less desirable or hopefully not, but maybe destructive behaviors come out. Um, how do I know um, during Cali, I was doing uh, this, a similar thing. Um, and Doreen Kelly, who's the head of Ravenscroft, some of you might know her. She said that whenever she gets a new board chair, her first question to them is, how am I going to know when you're under stress? Um, and that's really what the HCS is getting at. When, when you are working with a head of school, how are you going to know when that person's under stress so that you can separate those behaviors from where, the, where they're coming from? And how can you help them? Okay, um, you know, if you have somebody who's maybe really high excitable, who, who gets really worked up and angry, and um, how do I then perceive that? Okay, he's not angry, he's just feeling stress and feeling a loss of control. How can I then separate that behavior to, okay, how can we get back to a place where we um, feel that control again? Um, so um, when we talk about um, how we use this in searches, it's not just using the data that comes out of the Hogan, but also our own interpretations of people. Okay, I see these behaviors. What does this mean from a personality standpoint? Where's that coming from? And, and you alluded to the next phase. So do you mind telling us a little bit about what's coming next? Yeah, so the next was asking the heads to take the second assessment, which is the Hogan Development Survey. Again, we'll do something very similar. There's only gonna be seven articles this time. Um, but um, looking at um, you know, heads next to corporate um, and what are the ways that maybe corporate leaders handle stress? What are the, the patterns of behavior that they show and how might that be different from heads of school and how they, the patterns of stress that they show? And we don't have the data yet, so we don't know yet. <laughs> so stay tuned. Stay tuned. Well, when you think about someone who, who isn't sure whether or not they aspire to a headship, right? They, they know that they want to lead and they want to have influence on their school or on the lived experience of students in a school. Do you have any advice? Well, I think talking to heads, you know, talk, having mentors who are heads and talking a little bit about, um, you know, for me, this is what I really like about my job. And I can see maybe being a head as having a bigger influence. Um, and getting that advice is like, yeah, I think that that's right on, or no, actually, you're not gonna to get to do any of the things that you actually enjoy. And that, that the head job is probably going to, you know, be really difficult for you if, if that's the piece. Um, so I think that's, an, that's a really important piece. I think talking to, um, you know, your family, if you're a part of a family, because it is a, it's a, everybody's sort of involved. Um, 
I did aspiring heads in 2006 and learned from that that I didn't want to be a head. So I thought it was an incredibly helpful process. Um, and for me, one of the things that in my conversations about what I learned and with my own um, spouse and she's saying, yeah, I don't think that's a life that we want to live and me agreeing with that. I told that story to um, Bob Shirley, who some of you might know at dinner with his wife and his wife said, I never want to be a head of school either, a uh, head of school wife either. <laughs> so sometimes we ignore that. But, um, uh, you know, I do think talking to people in the job um, is the best thing that you can do. Yeah. Well, thank you. It is 1230, so we are out of time, but Jamie, thank you. And I think I'd love to have you back in a year. Maybe we can be an annual event and you'll report in each year on how your research is progressing. Absolutely. We'd love to talk about the, the next phase and then there will be a third phase. So we can keep going around. Thank you. And I put into the chat, everyone, um, links to the research studies and also links to our poll. And I'm sure that Jamie would also welcome a question. Um, if you think of something later, you can reach out to Jamie. Absolutely. Of course. Alrighty. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye. -bye. Thanks.